All right, we'll get going. So um, welcome everybody. My name is Braden Waters. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for CGIS. And uh, thanks for uh, showing up and participating in uh, today's webinar. This is our 12th in our uh, series. Uh, it's great to see so many people registered and uh, signing up. Uh, the numbers continue to grow and uh, it's uh, fantastic. We uh, truly value continuous learning at CGIS. Uh, we uh, we value the uh, information and in working with our clients, learning uh, new applications, uh, seeing different challenges, uh, working with our vendors to learn more about valves and uh, something that we truly uh, value at CG. And so uh, we'd like to share that back with uh, our, the valve community and uh, hopefully uh, continue to put these on. So today's uh, webinar, Debunking Control Valve uh, Misconceptions, we'll uh, get into that in a moment. But first thing I like to do is start with a safety moment. So uh, it's spring is out there, the sun's, in, sun's out, weather's getting better. Uh, that means uh, new riders uh, or new set of riders back on the roads with bikes and uh, motorcycles. So um, the safety moment for uh, today, um, slow down, uh, make sure you take the time uh, when you're in your vehicles, um, doing your shoulder checks, making sure that uh, you're aware of your surroundings, uh, especially with lane changes um, and turning corners and things like that. Uh, so just so we really want to make sure that uh, when you get into your vehicles, you're, uh, you're taking the time to uh, get safely to your destination. So uh, I just wanted to go through that. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into it. So again, like I said, we truly value the uh, the feedback and the information we get from our uh, our uh, our clients and our vendors. Uh, so we really do encourage uh, questions throughout the webinars. Um, at the bottom of your screen, if you hover, or maybe on your top of your screen, depending on your computer, you'll see a Q and A box. Uh, please feel free to th throw a question in there at uh, any point. Um, we'll try to get uh, those questions answered right away, and then we'll loop back and we'll talk about them at the end of the, uh, the webinar uh, with uh, the Q and A session. Um, there will also be a poll. I see there's a poll question on the screen right now, so please feel free to uh, answer that. We'll uh, close that out in a couple of slides here, and then uh, we'll have a second poll question at the end of the presentation, uh, and we'll follow up uh, with an email with the recording, um, another survey, and a couple pieces of collateral. So uh, uh, please look out for that. All right, for those that uh, don't know CGIS or uh, maybe uh, new to uh, CGIS, um, CGIS started in 1980. Uh, we uh, quickly transitioned from a commodity distributor uh, valves uh, to uh, more of a knowledge-based supplier providing our clients with uh, sustainable solutions. Um, like I said, we'd love to uh, understand the application before uh, we select the valve. Uh, we see the, the evolution of process getting more and more difficult. And we truly believe that there's a, a need for a different approach for valve selection. Um, we like to believe that we're the uh, recognized leader in providing intelligent solutions for valve's customers' severe service needs and really leading the, um, the industry in uh, defining what severe service is all about. Uh, joining us in our presentation today is uh, our one of our newest partners, uh, Samson, a uh, very well-known brand in the, uh, in the control valve market and other uh, valves. Uh, Samson was founded in 1907 in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, today, they've grown to uh, massive global presence. Uh, over uh, 40 countries are uh, represented, 200 plus locations and 18 production sites worldwide. Um, one of the things that really attracted us to Samson when we partnered with them was the fact that they are not only global, but uh, have a, a massive presence in Canada as well in our backyard. Uh, so Samson Controls Canada was uh, founded in 1983, uh, headquartered in uh, Markham, Ontario. Uh, not only do they provide the valves, but uh, they have a full uh, team of uh, project engineering. Uh, they provide turnkey package solutions. Uh, they do the inventory assembly uh, as well as full service uh, capabilities across Canada, partnering with companies like CGIS um, and the technical support. Uh, today's panelists, uh, we've got uh, two powerhouses of uh, both CGIS and uh, Samson. So we've got uh, uh, Dave Friesen, uh, president of CGIS. Dave's uh, got 36 years of customer-centric sales experience in the industrial valve automation and fluid power. He holds a Bachelor of Arts Economics from the University of Western Ontario and is an avid member of the soccer community in Alberta and Sherwood Park, where he enjoys his passion for both playing and coaching as well as volunteering as the district uh, president. Uh, Joe Ferrero is a president and CEO of uh, Samson Controls Canada. Uh, Joe has 10 years uh, in the process and automation industry with Samson. His background in mechanical engineering from Ryerson University. He's a certified professional engineer from Ontario. 
and is a board member of the Canadian Process Controls Industry, CPCA. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out the poll question and um, hand it over to uh, Dave uh, to take us through the next slides. Two plus years. There we go. Okay. <laughs> thanks very much, Braden. Um, first, uh, thanks very much, everybody, for joining uh, again. So I see our numbers are up to 100 and 150 almost. So that's fantastic already. Um, so we wanted to just talk about uh, what's been going on at CJS for the last uh, few years. Um, the, the big push this past year with, uh, with COVID and everything that's been going on is that uh, we've really looked inside the company and to understand what makes us us and uh, what is unique. Uh, so we've really looked to define our social purpose in the world. We've come up with this statement that we engage the world's industrial leaders and create sustainable solutions one valve at a time. Um, and what this is about is really getting to the heart of some of UN sustainable uh, de development goals and uh, around quality education, which obviously these webinars are at the heart of that, but um, it extends much more than this. We do a lot of internal training. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one client training, and we're even uh, opening up a, a tool that we use internally called CGU with uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, courses that we've developed over 20 plus years, and we're starting to, uh, to share that with customers as well. So there's quality education, industry, and innovation. We think that uh, there's a lot of challenges in the world today and uh, that it's going to take a lot of people working very hard, a lot of smart people. Um, and our, our hope is to work with those, uh, the, those uh, interested leaders to, to find ways to solve those challenges that are very significant and very real in the world today. Um, so some of the, uh, some of the challenges, um, CGIS believes that you can and you should expect more from your valves. Um, number one myth that we hear is that, well, you know, control valves fail regularly. I was uh, interested to see in the response there that uh, um, almost half of you folks that answered the question believe that uh, control valves should last at least two years, your severe service control valves. That's good. Um, a lot of people that we, we deal with um, tell us quite often, oh, less than a year is expected to change out trim. We think that uh, in a lot of cases, that is, the, that is what we see but we think that the opportunity is there to enhance those greatly. I'll show you on the right-hand side, there's a picture of a, a bit of a torn up ball valve. Um, that was a, a client, a once through steam generator uh, user or operator in Alberta uh, that was using a conventional control valve, a, a globe style control valve from a extremely well-known manufacturer. Um, and they were getting about eight to 12 months on average service life. That valve that you're looking at was returned to us in February of this year. Um, we sold it in 2006. So 15 years after it was installed, it was sent back for, uh, for maintenance and because it had started to leak. So we think when you truly understand the problem that, uh, that a valve has, then the opportunity to extend that life significantly is enhanced greatly. The next, uh, the next myth that we want to talk about is this pit crew mentality. Um, sometimes we go into a plant and people will say, yeah, we don't have any of your plant, you know, any of your valves. But what we realize is, well, we've got some, but you've never had to deal with them because they've been in and they've been working quite well. Um, so uh, our, our theory here is that if the, if the customer tells us that, oh yeah, it's not a problem for us anymore, we could change that valve out in two hours. It's probably because they've had an incredible amount of practice at doing it. And, uh, and that's often a, an opportunity for us to look at the application and the technology that's being uh, employed and see if perhaps there's a better opportunity or a different way to do that, uh, to manage that process. So what CGIS has uh, come up with uh, is this, this flow path through our business, um, essentially a better approach to sustainability. And really the key here is the, the feedback loop that we've incorporated. So. Um, we've got, as business comes into the industry, or sorry, into our facility, it's either typically a day-to-day -day kind of an application, a, a generic application, what we call streamlined, where we, the client knows what, they, uh, what they've used historically, they're happy with the performance of the valve, um, or they just need to add more equipment, so that goes through, the, through a streamlined opportunity. Projects are obviously that, more CapEx type applications or engineered solutions where clients come to us and say, look, we got a real problem here and we haven't been able to solve it. Can you help us? Um, so 
at some point though, the client installs that equipment and it's going to need service at some point in the future, even if it's that valve after 16 years. At that point though, our, our goal is to extend that regardless of what the performance in the valve is, we always ask the question, how can we make it better? And so this has been a, an approach that I think a lot of people have, uh, have seen the benefits and like the, the benefits they're getting from, uh, from this different approach. Um, this is uh, the, the, the ongoing struggle that we run, CapEx trumps OpEx question. Um, and uh, we see it time and time again. We deal with uh, people in the field and they're frustrated by what they're given <laughs> uh, to run their plants with. And um, so this is obviously not a control valve application, but I think the numbers are very, are, are all the same essentially. Um, I think the most important thing is that what you see here as you travel from left to right is, you know, an initial installation. How did the valve perform? What, what did we learn from that application? Um, how did our new valve perform? And then what modifications can we make over time to continuously extend that life? So this is really the opportunity that, uh, that we look and, and how we look to support our clients in the best way to drive that lowest cost of ownership. And the next one, last myth is that one size fits all. Um, there's applications out there, V-balls and other things like that, that type of technology, rotary platforms that can be used across many, many spectrums. But the reality is, is that it's not the ideal solution um, for every application. And um, we run across this quite often and we, we hear this, uh, this phrase now and we see it quite often in plants is loss of process containment. Um, valves holing out through the side of the body and the like. Um, obviously, in some applications, it's just a, a housekeeping nightmare, but in other cases, it can lead to fire or, or, uh, or potentially uh, life-threatening situations. So um, these are the things that we want to talk about. And this is one of the things that drew us to Samson is, the, is the, uh, the multiple ways that they can get at it, any one given solution. And so with that said, I think I'll, uh, I'll turn it over uh, at this point uh, to Joe. Um, this is a phrase that I'll ask you to keep in the back of your mind. The application dictates the valve. So don't try and shoehorn the valve in. Understand the application first, and then you can pick the technology that suits it best. Thank you, Joe. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, I think you set the stage well there. I'm just gonna pull up uh, the presentation here. Give me one second. All right, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Really looking forward to uh, this very loaded topic, uh, something I'm very, very passionate about, obviously working for a control valve manufacturer myself, um, but even with my engineering background, it's something that I definitely uh, pay deep attention to. Uh, just quick agenda for the day. Uh, we're gonna be running through uh, just an int introduction here uh, to really set the stage for everything that we're gonna talk about. Uh, we're going to jump into seat retention methods and plug guiding designs as it relates to globe control valves and really just giving you the lay of the land so that you have a better understanding of how to make those selections going forward, uh, depending on what your application is. Uh, secondly, we'll be looking at uh, rotary plug valves versus segmented ball valves. Um, that's uh, a topic that I absolutely love and I can't wait to discuss. And then lastly, we're going to be going into uh, linear and rotary actuators in the different types so that we can uh, really generate an understanding there um, and break some of the st stigmas that you hear uh, in the market today. So first I'm going to start with uh, with jumping into life cycle costs. Uh, Dave kind of touched on it a bit already. Um, he mentioned total cost of ownership, the one size fits all mentality. All that type of stuff really builds the foundation for talking about life cycle costs here. Um, essentially when you look at life cycle costs, it's divided up into four different sections. You see from the manufacturer side, when um, designing a valve, when selecting a valve and actually manufacturing the valve, how that actually builds up to the sale price at the end of the day. Um, at that point, there's the transition to the acquisition, acquisition um, and selling stage um, where the customer would really take that price and pay attention to that price that they're receiving from some of the different man manufacturers. Um, and then make that decision based on that. Um, it's really during this stage that the plan operators will need to take into account the additional startup cost as it relates to um, the valve that they are selecting. 
Um, and really, since these costs are really independent of the control valves um, or the valve sales, the cost of development under this stage is actually very similar. Um, when you move to the last stage, which is actually one of the most important stages, it's, it's really the service life stage. It's in this stage where the cost behavior um, causes the control valve to amortize the higher acquisition costs after a certain amount of time. So again, when you take a step back to the beginning and you look at different manufacturers that you're sourcing from to purchase a valve, um, you know, when you're purchasing from a higher quality manufacturer that is paying attention to sizing and selecting the proper valve for your application, it might mean that sometimes the costs are higher when you're comparing it to some that aren't necessarily an apples to apples comparison. Um, and, and it's really now transitioning back to the service light stage where you'll see that kind of come to life, where although one valve may have cost more at the beginning and another would have cost less, um, once it gets to the service life stage and you factor in things such as uh, operating costs, maintenance costs, um, spare parts and things like that, where you start to see that spectrum really change. And maybe that valve that you purchased at at the cheaper price originally ends up costing more in the long run. Um, always diff a difficult point to argue, but it's definitely something that you want to pay attention to going forward. Control valves are very complex and highly uh, engineered um, items at the end of the day. They, they're really tough to commoditize. Um, and that's why when it comes back to that, avoiding the one size fits all mentality, you want to make sure that you're sizing and selecting a control valve specific to each application that you're working within. Um, so for the valve sizing process, um, this means that the process data needs to be specified. Um, the more that we understand about the process, the better we can make decisions um, and a selection there um, as well. Um, things like understanding if the medium is corrosive or if there's solids in the medium or um, any chemical additives that may affect the material selection are also very important uh, considerations for the manufacturer. Um, you know, when, for example, when you're handling solids, um, the plug guiding systems that you may want to select maybe ones that aren't as susceptible to dirt particles, uh, which would lead to long-term problems. Um, so those are just some of the things that you wanna pay attention for. Um, and as it says in the first bullet point there, when it comes to reducing the, the life cycle costs, uh, the control valve needs to be viewed as a comprehensive package. Oftentimes we focus so much on the control valve itself and we forget about the other components of the valve package, such as the actuator, uh, the positioner and the valve accessories. Uh, those play such a critical part in the overall service life of the valve. Um, and I'll draw some more attention to that later on in the presentation. Um, when we're looking at the process conditions that, that may go through the medium or the process conditions of the medium and how it goes through different phase transitions, those need to be analyzed as well. Um, so looking at things like um, uh, choked flow, flashing, cavitation, how those different cases may result in a different selection of trim design, whether it's a multi-stage trim, um, hardened materials, different valve style, what the flow direction may be. There's so many different uh, considerations to look at. Other things that we want to pay attention to are outlet velocities, um, vibration, noise levels, because that can also lead to mechanical damage, um, depending on the, the plug guiding method selected. As I mentioned, actuation and accessories also need to be checked because they will affect the controllability of the valve as well as have a long-term effect on things like the valve packing um, or, or the actuator diaphragm. And really the next uh, couple slides will just summarize everything that I've talked about here. Um, so again, when we're looking at everything that I just mentioned, we really wanna make sure that we're taking a holistic approach. Um, at minimum, we're always gonna be looking to have the process data. So your flow rate, your inlet pressure, pressure drop and temperature, understanding the medium to the nth degree, um, things like viscosity and density and how those can have a critical effect. Um, but just in general, the more we understand the application and the experience behind uh, valves in that particular application, the better that we can make um, a selection to maximize service life. Um, things as simple as leakage class could be a major factor in um, achieving not only the desired functionality, but really the valve selection at the end of the day. I'll give you a good example. Um, you may have a, a customer that specifies they need to have a class six shutoff um, in a steam application where let's say it's a higher pressure slash higher temperature steam. We know that soft seal um, will soften up at higher temperatures, which may lead to um, a short service life for the valve as that trim will wear out. Um, so then we need to look to other options. Will the metal, metal to metal seal that can achieve class six 
allow us to get a longer service life? Can we look to other soft seal materials such as peak that will give us a long-term service life? Um, so just once you get down that rabbit hole, there's a number of different things to consider. And that's why I always say control valves are so complex to make sure that um, you're sizing and selecting them properly. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, actuators and accessories also have an effect. Things like fail position, stroking time, they will impact things like actuator size, as well as the type of accessories utilized on the valve. Um, and then lastly, really depending on the valve type and the operating conditions, all the follow-up costs can account for really the total investment. Um, so again, just the, the message I'll leave you with on this slide is really taking a holistic approach. Um, again, just summarizing what I, what I just mentioned really was again, looking at the process data, um, you know, understanding if it, there's flashing going on, cavitation, noise, slurry, is it dirty, is it clean? All those different things will have an impact on the valve that we select. Um, and then depending on which manufacturer that you deal with, um, you know, many manufacturers have very broad portfolios with different types of valve technologies that they can utilize. Um, and again, hitting on that point of there's not a one, one size fits all or a one valve that can fit every application. Uh, we really need to decide which is best. So, um, you know, the, the, the image here is, is quite funny, but it's, it's actually a very realistic thing. Which valve do I need for my application? Is Globe best? Is Rotary best? What other valves exist out there that are, that are best suited for my application? Um, and then that really brings us to the valve selection criteria stage. Um, you see images of many different valves. You see a chart showing many other different valves that could be considered. Again, looking at everything that I've just talked about to really set the stage for this point, really taking that holistic view will determine which of these types of valves in the abundance that there is are best suited for the application. Hey, Joe, can I just chime in too? Yeah. Um, this is where uh, I just want to make sure it's clear. CJS is located across the country here, and actually we operate around the world, but uh, for the purposes of this conversation, coast to coast to coast in Canada, um, this is what we do every day, is uh, we have control valve specialists that are on our team, We've got about seven people that do control valves full time. Um, so those are the kinds of folks that uh, this is what we're after every day. We're not selling instruments, we're not selling electrical components and other stuff. Um, so if you're looking for valve expertise, come to people that do valves every day. And we can really, uh, we can really aid you in this because we see a lot uh, given the size of our team and the, uh, the interest we have in this, in this space. So thanks, Joe. Sorry, no, no, absolutely. And there's a, there's a certain level of, of trust factor that exists there as well with, with having someone that knows what they're talking about handle it. So it's a very good point to bring up. Um, just to summarize the introduction stage, um, the best way to draw attention to it is really to show uh, an example of what I'm talking about. So uh, you can see this example here compares two different globe valve versions um, at the incipient cavitation stage, which is really the stage leading up to cavitation. Um, you have the medium that's typically in a liquid stage making the transition to gas. The bubbles have formed, um, but they haven't imploded as that, re as that pressure recovers. Um, so you look at the technically ideal valve, which is version one and the wrong valve selection really, which is version two. Uh, the table there summarizes it really. Um, you see that they're using two, two different plug guiding methods. Version one is in the valve bonnet and in the seat. So we call that top and seat guided. And version two there is just in the bonnet only, which we call top guided. You can see the valve outlet velocity, which is often ignored, um, also differentiates between the two valve selections. Really in this scenario under version two, uh, you could see that uh, that manufacturer has chosen to go with the smaller nominal size. Um, and this is something that I often see in the market where we're so focused on just the valve CV that we often forget about other important factors such as outlet velocities, such as noise levels, which really affect the lifetime of the valve at the end of the day. Um, so you can see version one, they've selected the ideal size, um, which when you look at the service life over the 20 years, really that, that amortization is the cost of just acquiring the valve. Um, because it has lasted so long because we selected the right valve at the beginning. Version two, because they went with a smaller valve and a simpler plug design, the acquisition costs are 30% lower, so it's a cheaper valve overall. Um, however, when you look at the subsequent maintenance costs, those end up being many times higher due to the increased out velocity, which therefore leads to a reduced service life. Um, and really the summary at the end of the day is um, the cost saved from purchasing version two up front is eaten up very quickly in less than a year of actually putting that valve into service um, because of the issues that occur um, because you have the wrong valve selection there. Moving on to uh, seat retention and plug guiding designs. 
Um, we're going to start off by looking at uh, two, two of the seat retention methods that exist in the market. We have the threaded in or screwed in seat design, and then we have uh, the cage retain or clamped in seat design, depending on the terminology that you may hear from manufacturers. Uh, really the importance of looking at uh, the seat retention methods, although the decision is often left up to the manufacturer and it is typically a point that's kind of swept under the rug and that people don't really pay much attention to, it can really have drastic effects on the longevity of the valve. Um, certain manufacturers lead to market with, with different seat retention technologies. Some have both available, others only have one. But really what I'm looking to do is build the understanding that one method or technology isn't best in every single case. Both of them can be used in different applications. That's key to pay attention to. I'll start off with uh, the threaded in seat or screwed in seat design, just to give you a brief idea of the operation of it. Uh, the seat is screwed into the body with a straight thread. So that means it's not tapered, it's not MPT, it's a G thread, which is straight. Uh, the benefit of using a straight thread there is that it allows for ease of disassembly as well as assembly after the fact so that the seat is replaceable. When you do take the seat out of the valve for repair, it doesn't gull any of the threads on the seat or in the body so that everything can be reusable. Um, so that's an important point. Um, really the pressure drop through with this design is created in the free cross-sectional area between the seat and the plug, which is, is pretty typical in any seat retention method design. Um, the plug is guided into the valve depending on the type of uh, plug. So it could be, like I've mentioned before, either top guided through the guide bushing in the bonnet um, or, or top end seat guided, depending on the plug type that's used. Um, obviously with a threaded in seat design, you're gonna need a seat tool, which is gonna be required to torque the seat into place. How the seal occurs is you're gonna have an offset of angles from the seat sealing surface to the body sealing surface, which creates the ultimate seal at the end of the day. So there's no seal in the threads. The sealing happens between uh, the seat and the body. Uh, with this design here, there's no additional shims. There's no additional gaskets internal to the design. Um, there's less friction. Um, as I mentioned, there's no gulling as, as the seat is disassembled. Um, there's no sealing in the threads because the seal is created in the, between the seat and the body there. So all of those are some misconceptions that you may hear in the market that I've kind of just uh, debunked right now. Summarizing some of the advantages and disadvantages that I've I just kind of mentioned. So when you look at the advantages, uh, the angled metal to metal sealing ensures a tight seal without the need for um, a seat gasket or a body gasket. Um, so that's kind of what I just mentioned. There's no sealing in the, in the threads. It actually happens um, between the body and the seat. There's no, no need for additional shims or gaskets, which are just additional wear parts. Um, you use similar seat and body materials, which prevents leakages during thermal cycling. So that comes down to the expansion and contraction of certain materials um, when you're combining different types of stainless, for example. Um, and lastly, with the design itself, you could see in the image that I just showed before, um, because the design is, is simplified overall, there's no additional shims and gaskets. You're reducing the amount of wearable parts, the amount of spare parts, which is reducing that cost in that acquisition stage or in that service life stage, sorry, that I talked about before. Um, and then really the ease of maintenance. It's really easy to maintain a valve that has less wearable parts, less, less parts in general. Um, so that's obviously a benefit. When you look at the disadvantages, one of the biggest disadvantages that are often viewed at are uh, the, the fact that the C tool is required. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. Um, and the fact that incorrect material selection could lead to galvanic uh, corrosion and steam applications. Um, and again, there are limitations to the threaded and seat design where in specific applications, depending on the type of failure that you're seeing, you may need to move to a different seat retention method design. Looking at the other version here is uh, the clamped in or cage retained seat design. Um, with this version here, you could see that the seat is shown in blue. There's no threads on the seat. It simply just sits within the body. Um, you have a cage retainer, which holds the seat in place. Um, uh, shown in green between the cage retainer and between the seats. There's often going to be shims or gaskets that are um, creating that seal between the two. Um, and then the bonnet is really used to torque everything and hold everything in place. Uh, between the bonnet and between that seat retainer, there's also more gaskets and more shims. Um, so you could see with this design, there's a little bit more going on internally within the valve. Obviously, with, with more parts um, and more material on the inside, you're going to create certain restrictions. 
um, which will affect the flow capacity passing through the valve. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. Um, but similar to the threaded in-seat design, you can use multiple plug designs in this valve as well. Um, and because of um, the design itself, it's often viewed as an anti-clog design, which means that it has lower tendency for deposits to form and clog the valve. Um, whereas when I talk about some of the other plug guiding or seat retention methods, that would not be the case. Looking at uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, technology here, um, on the advantage side, there's no special tools required for trim replacement. So um, as soon as you take that bonnet off, um, everything can actually come apart within, uh, within the valve itself. Um, however, on the disadvantage side, um, there is susceptibility to leakage due to thermal cycling, and that really comes down to the differences in material between, let's say, the cage retainer um, and the seat. Um, there are more spare parts. I said it was a little bit busy, as you can see in the picture. Um, so that means, obviously, the bill of materials for the valve itself will grow in size. That means that there's more wearable parts, such as gaskets, such as shims, um, that are required to, uh, to achieve that tight seal. And that's where, on the service section of the valve, the costs really start to increase. Because there are more parts, it means that the difficulty of, um, of repairing the valve is, is increased. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, and as I mentioned, the cage retainer actually adds additional restrictions to the flow. So that affects the flow capacity passing through the valve as well. Moving on to plug guiding, um, it also ties hand in hand with the seat retention methods. You have certain plug guidings that will be for certain seat retention methods. Again, depending on the manufacturer that you work with, um, there could be more options available. Um, we also have, um, so you see here, there's top guided, there's top and seat guided, and then there's cage guided. Um, we also have top and bottom guided plugs, which I, I'm not gonna talk about today. Um, it's a very similar concept to the top and seat guided version. Uh, the only difference being that you're gonna have an additional stem uh, that connects to the bottom of the valve to provide a double guiding. Um, typically that's gonna be used in severe service applications where you have cavitation um, to be able to hire those hand, higher, handle those higher pressure drops. Um, and reduce vibrations, which lead to wear. So I'm gonna start off with uh, the top guided version. Um, so this really ties into the cage retained seat design where you see it from some of the manufacturers out there. It's typically gonna use a parabolic trim, which is the, the plug shown in the picture there. It's more of a rounded trim design, um, which, which can be susceptible to high vibrations. As that plug lifts out of the seat and you have a full flow coming through the valve, um, there are going to be vibrations where that plug is vibrating in the seat that can lead to some wear and damage, depending on the application itself. Um, because parabolic trim is typically used in smaller valve sizes, um, that, that is also why this is prevalent. However, when you do move to larger valve sizes, there are other plug designs that you can consider, such as V-ports um, or perforated plug designs that may be more suitable from a control standpoint, as well as a service life standpoint. Um, however, parabolic trim does have a higher cavitation coefficient, which really means it delays the onset of seeing incipient cavitation compared to other trim designs. Um, so that's also something to, uh, to pay attention to. Um, top guided linear valves are, are most common in the industry. A lot of manufacturers do have this technology available to them. Um, it does provide good control valve performance. Um, the plug is guided through the bushing that's located in the bonnet. So you can see by the yellow arrows in the picture, um, that's really what it's showing. Um, and lastly, I already mentioned that uh, the parabolic trim is susceptible to higher vibrations. When you're looking at uh, the valve advantages and disadvantages for this, uh, this top guided trim design, um, as I mentioned, as the plug comes out of the seat, because it's a rounded plug, you're getting a full flow path, which means that it allows uh, small dirt particles to pass through uh, without getting trapped. Uh, so that is a benefit. Um, it does have a higher cavitation coefficient, which means, again, that the incipient cavitation is going to be delayed at higher differential pressures. Um, the disadvantages are because it's only guided at one point, that allows for more instabilities, so higher vibrations, which could lead to more wear on the trim. Um, and lastly, you're going to need larger plug stems to compensate, especially as uh, the valve size grows. Uh, that plug stem is going to need bigger, uh, need to get bigger to be able to deal with uh, uh, with the, the equivalent forces that are acting on it. Um, larger plug stems are known to wear the packing out quicker. So that's also gonna affect uh, the lifetime of your packing as well. Moving into top and seat guided. Um, with top and seat guided, it's more of a double guiding method where 
It's still going to be guided in um, the guide bushing in the bonnet, which I talked about on the previous slide. However, because the plug is V ported or, or uh, perforated, you can see it has what I call a little skirt on, on the trim itself, which actually adds as another point of contact or guiding method within the seat. Um, obviously, with, with, that, with that double guiding method that you have in place, it's ultimately going to result in less vibration. Typically, this trim design um, is going to be used in a threaded in seat or screwed in seat design. But depending on the manufacturer, it could also be available with the cage retained seat design. Um, again, it really depends on the manufacturer that you're working with. Um, you know, with Samson, we have, have all of these available to us to really make that right selection. So that's important. Um, um, and lastly, when the plug lifts out of the seat, there's a more even distribution of flow, which leads to better controllability. So that's something that, uh, that we really look at. Because now you have two guiding points, it's going to be a more stable operation. So you can actually do the opposite as the top guided plugs. You can use smaller stem designs, um, which will obviously lead to a longer service life overall. Looking at the advantages and disadvantages, um, on the advantage side, um, it's a fully open flow path. It still allows small dirt particles um, to pass through it without getting trapped. Again, the fact that you have double guiding at both the plug stem um, and the seat provides um, better guiding, better controllability, and therefore a longer service life. Um, on the disadvantage side, it does have a lower um, cavitation coefficient than the parabolic trim that I just talked about on the previous slide. So it means that it's gonna see cavitation um, at earlier stages than that parabolic trim uh, would. So that's something to pay attention to as well. Uh, lastly, the last plug guiding method is the cage guided trim design. Um, so with, with cage guided globe valves, you're, they're gonna be typically used in higher pressure applications, whether it be oil and gas or elsewhere, um, using higher differential pressures going through the valves. They're known for reducing cavitation, uh, noise levels and velocities. Uh, the plug guiding method is a little bit different. It's more robust, which is why it's used in these higher differential pressure applications. Um, it provides maximum stability, even under the most um, um, extreme conditions. Um, and really how it works is it's utilizing um, a piston that's guided into the cage and the pressure drop is created by the opening area in the cage. The minimum distance between the plug and the cage is ultimately gonna reduce vibrations. Um, and also similar to the cage retained seat design that I talked about before, using this guiding method in combination could lead to easier maintenance overall. Um, on the advantage side, you get uh, a massive guiding, so a much more stable guiding as well, which is why it could be useful in very extreme applications. Um, various radial noise attenuation um, designs for severe service application. Um, and then some of the disadvantages are um, potential for gulling because of the similar materials. Um, this does have the potential for small dirt particles to get trapped up in between them. So typically, if you hear that there's small particles in the medium, we might want to avoid using this type of trim design and look at some of the other options available to us. Um, and lastly, they're going to have lower uh, cavitation, uh, cavitation coefficients than some of the other uh, V ports and then parabolic trim designs. So it's going to see cavitation at earlier stages uh, than those other trim designs. Uh, really to summarize before I move on to segmented ball valves and rotary plugs, again, this is very important to pay attention to, although I mentioned it often gets swept under the rug or for the manufacturer to decide, um, but really the message is, is that there's many methods out there. Uh, there's no right one. It really depends on the application. I'm now going to go into segmented ball valves versus rotary plug valves. Again, this is one of my, my favorite topics out there. Um, I think with uh, segmented ball valves being a much older technology known to the market, um, it's a very proven and used technology that, that a lot of people know about. Um, it's often used out there in the market, sometimes even in applications where it's not best suited. The rotary plug valve came around into the market a little bit later. Um, it offers a lot of benefits. There's a little bit of gray area where the two technologies do overlap, depending on the pressure drop in the application. Um, but again, having both of these technologies available to us we're able to really make the right decision and the right selection to maximize not only controllability, but the service life as well. So I'm going to start off by talking about the rotary plug design. Um, so it's actually, you, you may hear multiple different terminologies for it, rotary plug, eccentric rotary plug, rotary globe, um, all of these different terminologies do apply to this valve here. Um, really how it's set up is it has a double offset design. Uh, what I mean when I say that is it has two offsets in the, in the way that it's made up. One of them is the plug shaft from the valve center line, and you can see that in the top picture. 
Uh, what that means is that the plug shaft isn't going to be located directly in the center of the valve. It's going to be slightly located up or down to create that offset. Secondly is going to be the plug face offset from the shaft center line. Really what that does is it allows a camming motion as the plug rotates into the seat. Um, and ultimately, because it operates that way where, the, where it creates that camming motion due to the double offset design, there's no friction as the valve rotates throughout its cycle from, from uh, beginning to end. The only point of contact between the plug and the seat is when the valve is, is fully closed. Um, so what that means on the opposite end, when you go to open the valve, as soon as you crack it open even one degree, uh, there's no friction, there's no contact between the plug and the seat, and you have the ability to start controlling. Although not ideal at smaller angles, you still have the ability to do so. Um, some of the benefits of this type of operation are, I mentioned already, you're going to eliminate friction during the valve operation. Obviously, with lower friction, that means many things. Less wear on your trim, it's going to mean less torque requirements out of your actuator, so you can actually use smaller actuation packages now that's gonna have an effect on bringing down the cost as well as uh, making you a smaller profile valve at the end of the day. Um, so that's, that's definitely a massive benefit. Uh, with the rotary plug valve, um, it's typical that they have more than one um, CV option per valve size. Um, so that's, that's good because now you can really fine tune the sizing to best suit the application itself. Um, I already touched on the fact that we're reducing wear on the trim um, because of, of the operation itself. I touched on the fact that we're reducing torque values as well, which is definitely a big benefit. All of these combined together lead to more accurate controls than some of the other rotary valve types out there. Um, and lastly, there's no dead spaces within the valve because it's not a floating, a traditional floating ball valve technology. There's no dead spaces. So this valve is typically being able to use in an abundance of different applications, whether it's clean mediums or dirty mediums, the versatility of this valve here um, is great where um, not only do you get that extended flow capacity above up and above a, a traditional glow valve, now you're able to use it in even more applications than you would be with, with a traditional glow valve. Uh, moving on, just a summary of kind of what I've talked about already. Um, because we're using a double guided or trunnion mounted trim design, you can see that the stem doesn't pass all the way, all the way through. There are manufacturers in the market where that stem does come all the way through the valve. Um, what that means with this design shown on the screen here, um, because it doesn't have a stem coming all the way through, when the valve is in its fully open position, there's a free flow path. So that means you're gonna eliminate uh, turbulence going through the valve, which is ultimately gonna affect uh, controllability in some of the instruments downstream. Um, also at the same time, it means you're maximizing the flow capacity through the, the specific valve itself. Um, and that's why you see mention of it has high range ability up to 200 to one, which is much higher than let's say a traditional globe valve, which would be 50 to one or even less um, and other valve styles out there. Um, because uh, you're able to reduce the amount of torque required due to the low friction design, you're actually able to use various actuator options. And this really isn't something that you see in the market from a lot of manufacturers. Um, I'll talk about it in the actuator section when we get to it, but uh, just to give you kind of uh, some insight there, with this valve style, you're actually able to use both rack and pinion and spring diaphragm actuators in addition to piston and other actuators as well. Sometimes you're going to run into manufacturers in the market where they standardize on spring diaphragm. Spring diaphragm is a great actuator that provides very precise control. Um, however, because the design generates less torque, you can actually have the ability to use a rack and pinion actuator. Um, because you're still going to have your positioner as your final control element, you're still going to get precise control at the end of the day, uh, while making the profile of the valve smaller, the cost much more effective as well. Um, so those are all considerations that we take into effect. Again, not only looking at the valve, but the actuator as well. Um, and lastly, because of the lack of uh, friction within the valve design, you're ultimately going to get longer service life out of the valve because you're not wearing the internal components out as fast. On the advantages and disadvantages side of things, um, I mentioned a lot of them already, but just to summarize. So with advantages, you have a high range ability up to 200 to one. I already mentioned that that's higher than some of the other valves that you might see out there. Suitable for precise control. Um, you know, Typically globe valves are, are viewed as the most precise control uh, valve out there. However, this is definitely a good second. And again, because it's so versatile to use in many applications, it's a good selection the majority of the time. 
It's suitable for, for high differential pressures. I mentioned the straight flow path already. There's no dead spaces. Um, because of the, the low friction in the design, it's good for high switching applications where you're opening and closing very fast. You don't have a slip stick effect and that's really due to the plug guiding design. Uh, there's little tolerance in there so you don't get that slip stick effect. I mentioned the reduced uh, actuator torque um, and therefore actuator size. Uh, the multi-spline connection um, in the stem allows for zero play as the valve rotates, so you're going to get more precise control. The trunnion mounted plug means that it's double guided, mounted from the bottom and mounted from the top without the stem going all the way through. Um, and lastly, it's a very compact design. On the disadvantage side of things, um, it's limited compared to a glow valve and the different noise attenuations or severe service options that you may have. Um, it's an inherent characteristic um, for um, for the plug design. So that means that it's kind of like a combination between equal percentage and linear. Um, although you do have the option of actually setting that within the positioner at the end of the day. Um, when you compare this to other valve styles that have equal percentage or linear characteristics, that could be a difference in the way that it handles the flow passing through it. Um, and lastly, the, the seat and plug replacement do require workshop repair. It's not as easy to uh, repair in the field. Uh, moving on to segmented ball valves, again, the very well-known technology. Um, sometimes you may hear them called uh, V-port valves, um, sometimes segmented ball valves, sometimes sand balls. Um, it's, it's, you got to be careful on the type of terminology that you're using because when I hear V-port valves, what I think of in my mind is a ball valve that is simply cut in a V-shape. Um, it's, it's a very low cost um, way to throttle the valve. Um, however, this leads this, this segmented ball valve, a true segmented ball valve, leads to more precise control than a standard V-port ball would. Uh, with, with the design itself, unlike the rotary plug valve, it only has one offset within the design that's really between the shaft and the plug face. The ball is segmented in a V-shaped profile. That's why sometimes you hear it called the V-port or a V-ball. Um, and really some of the benefits of this design is um, you have the option for linear or equal percentage using the same ball. It just depends on whether you're rotating the ball clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, it has a very high flow capacity, much higher than any valve style, higher than a globe valve, higher than a rotary plug valve. Um, so that allows you to stay within smaller valve sizes than the equivalent globe or rotary plug valve. You have very good control behavior over the full flow range, um, and there's less turbulences with the design itself. When you look at some of the summary of that and what it looks like, of course, it leads to a much more compact design. The, the reduction of weight and dimensions compared to a glow valve or some of the other valve styles could be a key factor, whether it's for an OEM or an end user looking to fit it within a tight space. I will touch upon that in a bunch of slides as well. Um, you do have the option for class four or class uh, six shutoff. So um, it allows to be able to use in control or, or on off applications. I mean, it does have a very high flow capacity, as I mentioned as well. So with range abilities uh, greater than 100 to 1. Um, I put greater than 100 to 1 because it really depends on the manufacturer and what they publish. Some manufacture um, 100 to 1, some higher up to 400 to 1. Um, it really depends. Um, so yeah, all of that with the higher flow capacity allows you to be able to stick within smaller valve sizes. Summarizing some of the advantages and disadvantages of what it looks like. Um, the advantages, of course, the high range ability allows, again, you to stay in, in smaller valve sizes. It's suitable for very low pressure drop applications. That's always the distinction that I like to make to customers is that the segmented ball valve is ideal. The ideal application for it is a one PSI pressure drop or less. That's where you're going to really need to use that extended flow capacity. However, as we all know, that, that's very rare to have a one PSI or less pressure drop in an application. So really up to five PSI pressure drop, this valve is still the ideal choice. Once you cross over that five PSI pressure drop and move to let's say 10 PSI, that's where the rotary plug valve becomes a very good option to be able to be utilized um, in the application as well and may actually provide better control due to what the sizing actually determines at the end of the day. When you look at the disadvantages, um, you're going to have a high pressure recovery factor in comparison with some of the standard valves. So that is going to affect the way that the flow passes through it, how things like velocities and noise levels are ultimately going to affect the valve. Um, it is more limited to differential pressures because of the, the design isn't as robust and it's not a severe service valve at the end of the day. So you don't want to be putting this type of valve in a severe service application. 
that's where the rotary plug valve might be a little bit more suited. It does have low throttling capabilities. Uh, there is really no noise attenuation methods that you should be using in this valve. So that's kind of some of the distinctions and where you may use, uh, may not use this valve and use a different valve. Um, there is higher friction because the ball is always in contact with the seats. There is higher friction. So that again is going to lead to more wear. It's going to lead to higher torque values, going to lead to our, uh, larger actuation packages, um, et cetera. And lastly, it's more susceptible to dirt getting trapped behind the ball, which is ultimately going to score the ball and then score the seat seals as well. Uh, the next slide, what I've done is kind of shown two images of, of the rotary plug valve on the left side and the segmented ball valve on the right side to just show you what the operation looks like from fully closed to fully open. So I'm going to punch through these next slides pretty quickly here. Um, so you can see I've, I've done the first, uh, first slide exchange. Um, I've, let's say we've just cracked the valve open. You could see already the rotary plug valve is actually, the plug is already off of the seat. So that's kind of what I mentioned before, where with the segmented ball valve, that ball is still in contact with the seat. So that of course is going to affect not only where, but the level of controllability, even at small operating angles. And as I run through it, you could see uh, what I'm talking about. And that's really comes down to the double offset versus single offset design between the two valves. So I'm just going to go through these slides real quick here. And you see with, uh, with the rotary plug valve, no friction along the way. Um, sorry, as, as you get to the fully open position, you're going to have a full flow path. Um, so that is ideal for generating that maximum rangeability and flow capacity. Uh, to start to draw down on, on this topic here, when we look at CV value, I've kind of talked about it already. The segmented ball valve has the highest flow capacity compared to any of the other valves listed up there. The table in the bottom right really shows that. As you increase in valve size, you can see it becomes more apparent where there's that separation between the different CVs between the valve styles. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, although that ne doesn't necessarily dictate that it has to be that valve style. There are, again, drawing back to the introduction, many other factors to consider which valve is actually right for the application. And then looking at the weight, although sometimes not always taken into consideration, you compare the weight of some of the equivalent valve styles here, let's say in four inch, um, you can actually see that uh, uh, when you're looking at control valves specifically, the rotary plug valve would actually be the lightest weight valve because it's more compact with the design itself. Um, and that talks about some of the design features that I mentioned before. So obviously when you're looking at it from a total cost of ownership perspective, um, a lighter weight valve is gonna be cheaper to ship. Um, you know, you're gonna need less pipe supports in, in, the, in the plant. So there's a number of factors that, that also tie into that as well. Um, and lastly, really comparing the valve styles against some of the criteria on that you see listed on the left. So flow rate, differential pressure, rangeability, control quality, sensitivity to dirt. Um, you could see pretty much the rotary plug valve is, is a good valve selection in almost any application. Um, you know, whereas the, uh, the segmented ball valves and others may be a little more limited, but it's something that you definitely want to pay attention to going forward, um, really what valve you can use in which application. So something to keep in mind. Um, and just lastly, a sizing comparison, just to show you. So I ran a quick example to really show what it would look like uh, between a rotary plug valve and a segmented ball valve. Um, just uh, easy, easy flow and pressure drop scenario here where we have standard flow rates at ambient temperature with a two bar uh, differential pressure. Um, you could see some of the sizing results here, but I'm going to jump into what it would look like from a segmented ball valve. And then on the next slide, what it would look like with the rotary plug valve. So with the, with the scenario that we've keyed in, this is what it would look like uh, or what the selection would be for a segmented ball valve. It would end up being a six inch size um, because the segmented ball valve only has one CV, although it does have a characterized trim, um, you're stuck with the CV 1330 that's shown there. You could see the outlet velocity is less than five meters per second, which is the limit for this type of valve. And the operating range is gonna be on the low end between 13 and 38%. Um, and this is a very common scenario that I often see out, out in the market because, again, we're using this valve in applications where maybe it's not best suited. You end up going outside of that ideal flow control range that you want to be in. Typically, you want to be between um, 30 and 70 percent, some, some published 20 to 80. Um, but obviously, you can see in this scenario here, we're outside of that. We're on the much lower end. That is going to affect the overall valve service life at the end of the day. When you look at the equivalent rotary plug valve, 
Um, you can see that we were able to fit it in a four inch valve. We're still able to get that CV that we need um, because the rotary plug valve can handle higher outlet velocities than the segmented ball valve, even though it's seven meters per second, that's fine because the limit would be 10 in this type of valve. And you can see the operating range from a flow control perspective, we're from 15 to 75. So we fall a little bit more into that ideal range that we want to be in. Um, so that's just a good example. It's, it's one that I often see out in the market. Um, and again, it really dictates why it's so important to really pay attention to these types of characteristics. Um, and this is just really the summary. I also did the same with a globe valve and a butterfly valve um, and ultimately ranking them at the end of the day. You could see that in this scenario, at least the rotary plug valve was, was the more ideal choice. Uh, and, and just to summarize that really some of the other valves could still be installed in there. They could still work. It just may not lead to the longest service life. Um, so that comes back to taking that holistic approach. Moving on to actuation for rotary and linear valves. Um, I'm gonna kind of buzz through this because I see my time is running out. Um, on the linear side, we have uh, three different actuation op options. We have um, a nestled multi-spring diaphragm actuator. We have a single spring diaphragm actuator and we have a piston actuator. Uh, for the sake of time and for the sake of the presentation, I'm not gonna focus on all the other actuation options that exist out there as well, um, such as electric, hydraulic, or manual. If you look at uh, the control valve market, the vast majority, I would say 60% and greater, is gonna be with, uh, with pneumatic actuation. Starting off with uh, the multi-spring pneumatic spring diaphragm actuator, just simply the operation and how it works, you would have air coming in the bottom ports of the actuator into the air chamber. Um, once it fills it up, it would create pressure, which would compress the springs above it. Um, and that would in turn create the equivalent force on the plug stem and allow the valve to open or close. Um, because there are multiple springs in the actuator that does lead to a number of different benefits. Um, it's gonna lead to a more stable control performance overall. It's gonna lead to less hysteresis. Um, you could see things such as uh, the rolling diaphragm, which has that lip on it, that's gonna create less stress on the actuator diaphragm itself. Um, because there is less hysteresis, that in turn is gonna create less friction. Um, both of those combined are gonna lead to longer service life for your actuator diaphragm and actually for your valve packing as well. And that's why I mentioned the actuator selection is so key for also determining the valve service life uh, that it definitely needs to be a key consideration. There are various signal ranges that you could utilize um, depending on what the shutoff pressure is. So the, the different signal ranges will allow you to create that uh, force that you need to shut off. Um, and there is the possibility for an integral mount version, which would hide the linkage for the positioner and protect it in uh, much dirtier environments. Looking at uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the design, um, it's a very small profile because the springs are nestled. The largest spring size is gonna be fixed. As the shutoff pressure increases, you have the ability to add smaller springs within the large springs, as opposed to a single spring design where the spring is gonna be very tall. This keeps the actuator size fixed, which ultimately is gonna create a much smaller profile for the overall valve, reduce the valve weight, um, et cetera. It does have a field reversible fail, uh, fail safe, so you can go from fail close to fail open very simply. Um, there are a large number of string combinations, as I mentioned, so um, that's key to keep in mind. Um, um, whereas with the single spring actuator, for example, you're limited to the one spring and then you'd have to go to a different size if you need that extra force. The rolling diaphragm is gonna reduce stress on the internal components, lower friction and lower hysteresis. That is such a key fact uh, for controllability and for service life for the valve. Um, and it does have the ability to generate high forces and high speed. On the disadvantage side, it's not as applicable for larger valve sizes because ultimately you're gonna to get to a limitation where it can't generate that force that you need. And that's where it's time to shift to maybe a piston actuator or hydraulic. Um, I wrote it's not suitable for double, uh, double acting applications. And I put an asterisk beside it because it is a spring return um, by design, but by adding accessories such as pneumatic lockups, you do have the option to be able to use it in double acting applications, which would generate uh, a fail, fail last, fail safe, fail safe position. Um, so there is that, uh, that benefit as well. Moving to a single spring actuator, the functionality is gonna be very similar to a multi-spring. Really the biggest difference is the fact that it only has one spring within the actuator. You could see that the spring is very tall. It leads to a much larger overall profile. 
Um, and really some of uh, the things to pay attention to with the single spring design, again, it's still gonna work, it's still gonna lead to control, but it's not, it might not lead to that, that longest service life that you may be looking for. It's gonna generate one point of, uh, of contact uh, between the diaphragm, which may actually lead uh, to quicker failure. There is gonna be more hysteresis and more friction that comes into play, which could impact other components within the valve as well. Um, however, at the same time, with that being said, um, you can see that there are various actuator sizes if the shutoff pressure were to exceed a limitation in one size, so you can move to other sizes with stronger springs. Um, with, this, with this actuator design, you can only do no more mounting, which means that the linkages would be exposed. That means that the positioner would mount on the bonnet of the actuator, not uh, integrally, like I mentioned with the previous actuator. Um, and there is no option for field reversibility with this valve, or the, with this actuator, sorry. Um, you only have uh, the option for one or the other, um, and there's a different model that would allow you to achieve the, the opposite functionality. Looking at the advantages and disadvantages, uh, on the advantage size, again, you're not wearing the soft seals used to separate the actuator chambers, um, and there is a high thrust capability. But on the disadvantage size, as I've kind of mentioned already, a very large profile overall, you have stretching of the diaphragm, which creates additional stress on the internal components. Again, that depends on the manufacturer, whether they're using uh, a rolling diaphragm or a flat diaphragm. Uh, not suitable for double ap acting applications. Again, I put an asterisk beside that because again, depending on the accessories that you use, you could have the ability to achieve that functionality. Um, and the fact that you have separate models for fail close or fail open will lead to a, low, low, a higher total cost of ownership. Uh, lastly, on the linear side with the piston actuator, you're able to generate much higher forces, so it becomes much more prevalent in larger valve sizes. Um, you're able to achieve a lower friction and lower hysteresis operation, similar to what I mentioned with uh, the multi-spring design. Because there are no springs in a piston actuator, um, it's just going to be the air that's creating the force. It does have the option of being used for double acting applications, um, but typically where I see this is either for large valve sizes or for special uh, application requirements, such as uh, PSA, which is pressure swing absorption, uh, where you need a quick response from, uh, from the actuator itself. Um, on the advantage and disadvantage side, uh, the advantages of the actuator itself, again, double acting uh, possibilities. It's generally used for high force applications where large travel or large travel applications where the diaphragm actuator is not ideal. You still have a uh, lower friction and lower hysteresis, which is ultimately gonna lead to a higher life cycle. The disadvantages are the sealing elements are subject to wear and lead to additional air consumption of the actuator. At the same time, in the simpler applications, this actuator could actually be overkill, could be, could be more costly. So that's something to pay attention to as well. Lastly, jumping into uh, the rotary actuators, you can see that we have rack and pinion, spring diaphragm and piston as well. So similar um, kind of methodology. Uh, with the rack and pinion actuators, uh, I always say they're, they're one of the most misunderstood actuators out there. Um, very common, there's a lot of them in, installed in the market today, but there's often a negative stigma around them as it relates to control valves. Um, but really at the end of the day, what I want you to keep in mind is that although the actuator may not provide as precise control as some of the other rotary actuator, actuator options, it's not the final control element, the positioner is. When you're dealing with a positioner on a rack and pinion actuator that has resolution less than a percent or less than 0.1% like our positioners do, you're able to actually compensate for the actuator controllability, which is still going to lead to very precise control at the end of the day. Um, and that's something that I wanted to put out there because it's definitely something that's often uh, overlooked or, or not considered at all. Um, so with, with this actuator, it's proven use technology in the market, essentially the operation and how it works is it's gonna be linear motion that's transformed to a rotary motion by the use of a rack and pinion. The pinion would engage the teeth on the rack and allow for that, that, that motion to occur, as you can see in the picture shown there. Um, the air pressure, pressure from the signal will apply an equal force on both of the pistons. This leads to constant torque being applied throughout the, the operation, whether it's opening or closing. There is a zero backlash transmission as it goes into the rotary motion. Um, there are a wide range of different sizes that you could utilize. Um, it is low friction design and you do have the ability of using it in both single and double acting applications. When you're looking at the advantages and disadvantages, um, it is a very compact and cost effective design at the end of the day. Like I mentioned, it, it is installed in a lot of applications out of there. It is suitable for the majority of applications out of there. 
The only real limitations are, as you can see on the disadvantage side, are the torque output. So as you grow in valve size, this actuator, just because of the torque limitations, may not be suitable anymore. It does have higher hysteresis, as I mentioned earlier, that is compensated by a more accurate positioner. Um, there is lower control accuracy where the positioner, again, would be able to compensate for that. Uh, there are many parts that are made up of the, the actuator itself, um, and it, do, it does have a higher air consumption compared to other rotary actuators. Moving into spring diaphragm actuators on the rotary side, there is single spring and multi-spring. So I'm going to talk about both of them, although they are very similar in application um, and operation. Um, so the way it works is very similar to the linear actuators that I talked about. You're going to have air that fills the actuator chamber, which allows the, for the compression of the spring and allows the actuator stem to extend or retract. Um, it's going to use an external lever, again, to convert linear force to a rotary motion and therefore a torque. It does utilize a rolling diaphragm actuator. Um, so those benefits would be similar to what I talked about on the linear side, where you're able to reduce hysteresis and increase controllability. It does lead to superior resolutions, uh, which is really looking at the millimeter of travel per degree of rotation of the plug. Um, and it is able to handle larger travels up to 200 millimeters. Um, so you can see with this actuator here, um, again, this is a common technology used in the market, but you could see when I move to the disadvantages and advantages slide, um, in, in a couple slides, there are some things that could be considered as well that may lead you down a different path for actuator selection. Um, and this is one of the most talked about things that we often try to um, really inform and create insight around for, uh, for, for customers um, because it's often misunderstood. On the multi-spring actuator side, you can have two versions, uh, multi-spring where it's centrally arranged and then multi-spring kind of like the nestled spring actuator I showed before, where you have multiple springs within springs as well. Um, really the operation is similar to what I talked about on the previous slide. The only difference is now you have more springs. So there are some benefits to that. Um, it is able to generate higher torque values than the single spring design that I talked about on the previous slide. However, the only downfall is it's gonna create a shortened travel only up to 130 millimeters compared to 200 that I talked about on the previous slide. Looking at the advantages and disadvantages, um, advantages, obviously it's best suited for precise control applications requiring superior resolution. Typically I tell customers, this is typically within 1% that you're looking for. However, keep in mind, those applications are very rare. If someone does specifically ask for that, then absolutely we will offer this actuator. Outside of that, as I mentioned, when you have a precise positioner um, that is really compensating for any losses in the actuator, there are more options to be considered that could be more effective from a profile standpoint or cost standpoint. Uh, it's nearly frictionless, similar to the, the linear actuators I talked about before. So there's no hysteresis. That means again, less wear on the actuator diaphragm and valve packing, faster step response, which again is gonna be, is gonna come back to the superior resolution topic. Um, and higher torque values you're able to generate. The disadvantages, again, larger profile. So it's a larger, more awkward profile that you maybe can't fit in tight spaces where a rack and pinion may be more suitable. Um, and again, I mentioned not suitable for double acting applications with an asterisk because that could be accomplished by using certain accessories. And lastly, the Scotch yoke actuator, um, it's gonna be used where you're, you need that extremely high shutoff pressure that the previous two actuators uh, wouldn't be able to offer. Essentially, the operation um, is going to convert a linear force to a rotational motion using a scotch yoke mechanism. Uh, when the air pressure is supplied into the cylinder chamber, a force is going to be applied to a piston. So almost similar to how the previous two actuators operate, where that air is going to create that opposing force. It's going to compress the springs, and that's ultimately going to lead to the, the force or the shutoff pressure that you're getting. Um, it's, it's pretty much only used for... Um, oh, Sorry, skip the slide there. I'll only used for high uh, torque applications or large valve sizes in, in high differential pressure applications. So um, it is gonna be more costly um, than your traditional actuators I talked about before. So you wanna be very specific about where you are using it. Um, and, and although it does develop higher torque, it also uses less air as well. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, the advantages and disadvantages on the advantage side, um, high torque values at the beginning and end of each operation, which is going to be better from a safety standpoint. It's going to use the same air supply as a rack and pinion actuator, but develop a higher torque. So you're actually overall reducing your air consumption. 
um, good regulating features and low friction operation, which will lead to a longer service life. Um, on the disadvantages side of things, uh, you're going to have wear of the sliding block in that scotch yoke um, mechanism. Um, it's unbalanced side loads, which may affect, again, some of the service life of some of the components. Um, only 90 degree rotation, and it does have a larger profile. Um, I think my time's up, so I, I appreciate everyone attending, and I appreciate it. It's a loaded topic. I know there's so much more I could have talked about. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. Of course, if you have any questions, we're always here to support. I will pass it back to uh, you, Braden. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Joe and uh, Dave, for a uh, great presentation. I went a little bit longer than uh, we had scheduled, but uh, I think uh, it was a great, uh, great piece of information. Some really good questions. Um, I've thrown the uh, contact information up there for both Dave and Joe. So if you guys have questions, feel free to get uh, in touch with uh, with us. Also, want to thank. Um, uh, Jason, who was uh, in behind the scenes answering some questions. Jason is VP of Sales for uh, Samsung Canada. Um, has also uh, been helping out with answering some of those questions. Um, we have recorded this, and we'll continue to record the Q and A session. So if you guys do have to run, I appreciate it. I know uh, time is uh, um, is a valuable commodity these days. So uh, um, please feel free to run, and we can uh, you can watch it uh, at the end if you need to. But I would like to get into some of the questions. There were some great questions that came through at uh, during this thing, so um, we'll, uh, we'll get into that now. Um, first question on the rotary plugs. Uh, is it flow to open or flow to close, and uh, can it be used for cavitating service? So it, uh, it can be used for flow to open or flow to close. It really is, again, the application that is going to dictate that. Um, so both of them are possibilities and that again is a benefit of, of the rotary plug valve compared to some of the other styles is that you do have the option of switching between one or the other, um, depending on the medium. Um, cavitation, it's, it's not ideal. We do have, have solutions that can combat against the cavitation to mitigate any damage. It really depends on the extent of the cavitation. So the extent of that pressure drop, you know, is it incipient? Is it full blown uh, cavitation? How big is that pressure drop? How big are the stagings of, of the trim solution that we need to provide to, to mitigate that damage. Um, so those are all things that we could consider. So difficult to give a really pointed response on that, that specific question, but uh, it would really depend on the application that we would take a look at. Um, of course, at the end of the day, globe valves are ultimately going to be the best suited to deal with things like habitation. However, that's not excluding a rotary plug valve depending on how, how, how the application actually is. Excellent. Uh, sticking with the rotary uh, platform, um, what other versions of trim um, are available? Do you guys see uh, for severe services? Uh, do you guys uh, have some additional trims for the VTEC? So for uh, for the rotary plug valve, the trim itself would be the design would wouldn't wouldn't change. It would remain fixed uh, no matter what the application is. What we would do to really combat some of the severe service applications could be. Um, simply looking at hardened trim materials, whether it be tungsten carbide or, or ceramic type materials. Uh, we could move to ceramic lining as well. Um, we do have anti-cavitation uh, orifice plates, so to say, that could fit within the valve as well. Um, so those are, it's not necessarily modifying the trim, but adding additional components within the valve design to mitigate that damage. Perfect. There was a great uh, comment and uh, or I guess, uh... Uh, yeah, comment that came into the uh, chat um, from a general contractor saying that uh, they bid a lot of jobs and they see a lot of the specifications as copy and paste for control valves from older, older projects. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, Dave or uh, Joe, do you guys want to comment on, on that and what you're seeing in the industry today? Dave, I'll let you take that if you want <laughs> first. I've, I've been doing a lot of talking, so if you, if yeah. you don't mind taking that, I can, I can answer it as well after. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is, I mean, uh, and, and Joe's answers or Joe's presentation today demonstrated the variations that are out there in the market. The reality is we, uh, we understand, and this happens a lot, where people uh, give us, uh, give us uh, cut sheets from past jobs and then say, well, just give us this so it gives us an idea. But then that gets carried through to the project. And at the end of the day, you end up with a, a less than optimal system um, in the, out there, and the client's not necessarily happy with it. So there's always a balance to be struck between the engineering hours required to get everything right and the uh, and uh, and and uh, the, the necessity to get the project done on time and on budget. So this is where um, again I want to come back to uh, coming to people that do valves every day. So CJS and 
and our partner Samson. Um, this is what we do. So we have a lot of experience and we can we can steer you away from things that we know are going to be problematic, uh, regardless of what's on the data sheet. So as long as you remain open to uh, to to discussions about uh, or challenges on on what we think might work better, then I think uh, the opportunity is there to create a successful project regardless. I think some of the, the most successful projects we've been involved or involved with are the ones that uh, you know make selection based on um, uh, eighty percent process conditions. But uh, it's being able to go in and work with the process team and the uh, um, the uh, yeah um, instrument and instrument engineers to uh, to really refine the solution. And it's, and it's not only looking at the valve and the data sheet, but also the the holistic process that allows us to really get uh, uh, the best selection uh, there's oftentimes you can put uh, um, restrictions downstream or you know the re to reduce the pressure drops so you take a lot of that energy off the control valve uh, especially when you have a, a large variation between your max min and, and normal um, if you can make some modifications or understand when you're how often you're going to see that min um, process and max process versus the normal process uh, you can size uh, your control valve um, a lot more accurately and, and ensure that long life. So that, one that other comment too, uh, Dad in Braden is that we've seen a shift recently. We've had two major projects in the last uh, 18 months where we've been awarded the job before the engineering started. Uh, so they came to us with sort of a, a basket of goods and said, we think this is what we're going to need. We put together a package showing how we would do the project. And we've been awarded the job. And then we worked with the engineering company throughout the development process. So it streamlines a ton of that back and forth and the three bids and a buy and all the work that needs to be done for that. So the, uh, the owners are seeing this as a different way to get to the heart of a project. And we've enjoyed the process. It's worked quite well so far in the two we've been uh, awarded. And we think this is going to continue to grow over time. Yeah, and I, I don't, I, you guys summed it up perfectly, don't really have too much to add. At the end of the day, it's it's about having those those resources to be able, but with the knowledge to be able to do that selection, and as well as the technologies to be able to choose from. Um, and, and working with uh, a company like Samson that has all of those available uh, could definitely be a benefit to the customer at the end of the day. Right. <coughs> all right, a uh, couple other ones here that come in. Um, uh, what what is the model of the multi-spring diaphragm actuator in the presentation? Uh, for sure. linear or rotary, do you know? I uh, assume linear. Yeah. Um, it would be uh, for 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 on the Samson side of things, it would be our thirty-two seventy-seven or thirty-two seventy-one, uh, depending on if it was an integral mount actuator or a more mounted actuator. Um, so those are the models there. All right, and. Um... Uh, which model would you recommend for district heating, cooling, pressure, independent control applications with actuator having remote control PLC op um, options? Um, it's, uh, back on that one. Yeah, it's it's a difficult. It's a, it's a load. It's a load. It's a tough one yeah. to be able to answer. As I mentioned at the beginning, so much to consider. So a little vague, but I would say definitely uh, reach out to us after the fact. We can get into more specifics and uh, and be able to support you there. No problem. All right, sounds good. So I just, uh, a lot of chats going on throughout, <laughs> I think. I think that may be it. Um, going to, uh, there's uh, just a last little poll question that I meant to launch. Oops, it's up there now, the poll question's on the screen there, if you have a chance to answer that. Um, otherwise, I think we're all good. If you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Like I said, you got the uh, contact information on there. Appreciate your time, everyone. And uh, Sam will be sending out a, uh, a package, an email afterwards, just uh, with some follow-up uh, information. So again, appreciate your time. Have a great uh, day and stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. Take care.